Hi, everyone. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you very much to Middle for allowing me to uh, uh, present my work. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm happy to be here to present the recurrent inference machines for accelerated MRI reconstruction. Uh, and what you see here, this image uh, on the right, is basically our algorithm in action, where we go from a sparsely sampled MR image and uh, through an iterative algorithm that I'm about to explain to you, try to reconstruct the ground truth image seen on the left. Uh, so, but first, let me start off by thanking CIFAR, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, for funding uh, most uh, parts of this project. Um, so, yeah, that's much appreciated. Uh, and uh, to begin to explain the, the model, I will first uh, introduce you to the measurement process of MRI. I'm sure um, many of you already know about it, but for those who don't, uh, MR images are uh, acquired not in image space, but in the spatial frequency space, known as K-space, um, and that's seen here. And once you have collected enough samples uh, to abide by the Nyquist uh, criterion, you can use the inverse Fourier transform to get your MR image. Um, however, collecting these samples is a lengthy procedure, so uh, each uh, sample is collected sequentially, and there are physiological as well as, well as uh, hardware uh, limitations in place that uh, um, uh, makes the process slow. So in order to speed up the scanning process, what we have to do is to uh, sparsely sample below the Nyquist criterion, uh, and using this, uh, this set of sparse samples, uh, when you apply, apply the inverse Fourier transform, you get this uh, corrupted image instead of the ground truth. Um, so the whole process of going from the ground truth image to the sparsely uh, selected samples, uh, we know this process. It's given by the forward model here. So Y is the acquired samples, and X is the true image. And uh, it is projected onto its spatial frequency space uh, using the Fourier transform, after which uh, many samples are discarded uh, through this subsampling matrix. And finally, some Gaussian noise is added due to measurement errors in the scanner. Um, so we know the process of going hair to hair and to hair, but then how do we go back to the original image? That's the problem uh, we're trying to solve. Um, and uh, usually, uh, this uh, problem is solved uh, through uh, optimizing for the maximum a posteriori, which is uh, a sum of the log likelihood and the log prior distribution of the image. Um, and uh, the log likelihood uh, distribution, we uh, know explicitly it's given by the forward model. It's just the error between the acquired uh, measurements and the reconstructed image in, fre in frequency space. Um, However, the, the, the prior distribution is uh, harder to pin down. Um, there's really no uh, explicit formulation of it, so uh, it's down to, it comes down to model design. Um, and in compressed sensing, compressed sensing is a state-of-the-art method that is non-deep learning based or non-learning based. And in this method, they use a sparsifying transform uh, with the L1 norm. Uh, and they use a transform that they know already that it is able to compress MR image as well, and therefore they uh, are, is able to, are able to reconstruct an image that abides by uh, the knowledge they already have about MR images. Uh, using deep learning algorithms, we can learn the prior from data instead, and there are already algorithms out there that do this, but I don't have time to go into much detail. However, I encourage you to check them out if you uh, are interested, because they're also great pieces of work. Um, so uh, we also learned uh, prior from, uh, from data, and uh, we use an algorithm called uh, recurrence inference machines, and they were first proposed by Patrick Putsky um, as uh, general inverse problem solvers. And uh, here we uh, apply them to the problem of accelerated MRI reconstruction. Um, so the recurrent inference machine is, uh, uses a recurrent architecture which uh, with uh, two states, one external state, which is actually the image approximation, and one internal state, which is uh, the same as uh, is commonly used in recurrent neural networks. Um, and the two states are maintained and updated by these uh, update equations. So the internal state is initialized to all zeros, and the external state is initialized as the corrupted image using the initial measurements. Uh, and H here denotes the, the network with the parameters phi. Uh, whereas G is uh, just a placeholder for the part of the network that updates the internal state. 
Uh, and as an input to the model, where, well, first of all, we input the internal state, uh, but also the log likelihood gradient. And uh, finally, the external state, uh, we also input so that the model can learn to evaluate the log prior gradient at the point x subscript t. Uh, so the log likelihood gradient and the uh, external state is uh, fed to the network so that it can learn to navigate towards the maximum a posteriori. Um, so this is what the network looks like on roll through time. And here we see the external state and the internal state being inputted into the network uh, along with the uh, log likelihood gradient. And out comes the incremental update to take and uh, an image space. And it's summed together with the previous external state in order to produce the next external state. And this process is repeated for a predetermined number of time steps. So in our work, we use eight time steps. Um, so let's have a look at the network itself. It looks like this. Um, so the network, as an input, you take the external state and the acquired measurements in order to produce the log likelihood gradient, which may look something like this, depending on the time step we got. Uh, and this is concatenated together with external states, fed into a convolutional layer, uh, activated by a ReLU, and then fed into a gated recurrent unit, which is responsible for maintaining and updating the internal states, uh, which we actually have two of. And these are just uh, internal states averaged across uh, feature maps. Um, so this is what they might look like. Uh, and finally, after this is uh, um, repeated twice, we have a final convolutional level uh, layer that um, produces the incremental update, which is summed with the external state to produce the next approximation. And for every approximation uh, that the model produces per time step, we uh, evaluate the uh, mean squared error. And then we average across all time steps, and that is our loss function that we back propagate through time uh, on all time steps. Uh, and in our work, we use three types of data. So the first type of data is a one millimeter uh, T1 weighted brain image from a three Tesla scanner. The second type of data is a 0.7 millimeter uh, T2 star weighted uh, brain image set from a seven Tesla scanner. And finally, we use a data set that is freely available online. Uh, that is a set of knee uh, images from a three Tesla scanner at um, a 0.6 and 0.5 millimeter T2 weighted images. Um, so uh, we use all these three types of data so that we can train a model on all three types and show uh, that uh, it's capable of generalizing across uh, different types of data that it hasn't seen during training. Uh, so we cross-evaluate the separate uh, the the models trained on the different data types on all separate test sets from the three data types, so that we can verify its general generalization capabilities. Um, during training, we generate uh, subsampling masks uh, using a randomly sampled uh, acceleration factor that is uh, sampled from a uniform distribution that covers uh, all acceleration factors that we use during testing. So we test on acceleration factor two, three, four, and five. And uh, to generate these masks, we use a Gaussian distribution so that the internal points, the center of K space, is more densely sa sampled than the external points because the central points of K space determine the general shape of the object, which is more important. So the algorithm's job is really to fill in the the blanks uh, of the high resolution uh, sort of points. Um, so as a uh, metric for the quality, the reconstruction quality, we use the structural similarity index. And uh, to compare against other models, we uh, uh, train a unit architecture for reconstruction, uh, which was proposed in the archive paper. Uh, and I don't have time to detail how it looks like, but I think you're all pretty familiar with this architecture by now because other people have uh, presented it. So uh, also, we compare against, against uh, compressed sensing the, uh, using a wavelet transform as a sparse transformation, which is uh, optimal for brain images. Uh, so here we see uh, our results, starting with the RIM that has been trained on uh, brain images from the three Tesla scanner, the T1-weighted images. Um, and compared to compressed sensing, we are doing a bit better, and we have a lower uh, standard deviation, meaning it's more robust against differences in subsampling patterns and um, uh, also the images themselves. Uh, and here is the UNET. So we think the UNET is uh, it's doing a bit better in the proposed paper, but we think it's struggling a bit because of the randomly generated subsampling patterns always being different all the time. Um, 
So here we go on to the T2 star weighted uh, uh, images, and it's the same trend here, basically. Uh, and finally, the, the knee uh, data. Uh, for this one, the compress sensing is struggling a bit, probably because um, it uses the wavelet transform, which is more optimal for brains. Uh, and the unit does uh, pretty well. This is the best performing uh, data set that the unit uh, can handle. But in general, the RIM is also better on the knee data set, so we think it's a bit uh, easier to reconstruct. Um, OK, but yeah, these models are all trained and evaluated on the same type of images. But now, this, uh, these models are, when you train on, uh, on uh, one data set and evaluate on the, on the other, how does the model do? And you see the two lightly shaded green here. They are the RIMs trained on the brain data. And it doesn't really matter too much what type of brain data you train it on. You can evaluate on a brain either way. And also, going from uh, brains to knees is not really a huge issue. It's doing fairly well there as well. Uh, however, training on the knee as a, the dark green uh, line, um, then it does worse than compress sensing when evaluating on brains. And for the unit, however, the overfitting is more pronounced. So uh, training on one type of brain and evaluating on another, you see that there's a drop in performance and vice versa for the other uh, uh, types of data. So here we see the, yeah, an example of a qualitative result. Um, this is comparing compressed sensing and uh, the RIM at the T1 weighted uh, brain images uh, at five times accelerated. And you can see it's quite uh, messy, but both algorithms managed to clean it up quite nice. However, I don't know if it's visible here, but maybe on the screens, um, we think the RIM has a bit more defined um, boundaries. And the compressed sensing image is a bit more noisy. Uh, here's another example. This is four times accelerated T2 star weighted. Um, and uh, for this type of data, it's really difficult to get the boundaries right. So things tend to blur a little bit. But we see the uh, general tendency being the same here, that more details are preserved for the RIM. And the uh, compressed sensing looks a bit more noisy. Um, here we compare against the unit. So this is the same image as before with the same acceleration factor. And you see the unit uh, struggles really for these high acceleration factors. Uh, and it creates this sort of uh, structure here that's not really in the target. Uh, but it's there in the corrupted image. So it's just uh, going off of this. Uh, so it shows uh, the necessity to have this uh, incremental or iterative procedure where you have to really reason your way. Uh, instead of going in one, one uh, feed-forward uh, motion. Um, yeah, so just to show uh, the robustness uh, uh, in variations in data. So this uh, is the same as the two images on the previous slide. Um, but these two ha are based on models that are trained on the T2 star weighted brain images. And you can see the RIM does uh, comparatively well. It's the same. Uh, however, the UNET really overfits on the T2 star weighted images. And you see this blurring uh, basically everywhere. And for the knee, as I said, it's a bit more of a struggle for the RIM to go from, uh, uh, from knees to brains. But it's still getting the general patterns OK, except that it's pretty noisy. Uh, the unit, however, is uh, really losing a lot of structure. Uh, this is another example of that. Here's the knee images. This is the target hair. And um, the RIM reconstruction, the unit reconstruction, and these are the reconstruction that were trained on brains. And you see it's really doing quite well here as well. You see some splotchy sort of artifacts here, but uh, generally I would say it's OK to, uh, to reuse on these. Uh, however, the UNET, again, it overfits by smoothening. And here you even see some uh, brain-like structures um, that are appearing in the knee. Um, so uh, we noticed that uh, most deep learning papers on accelerated MRI reconstruction tends to, uh, they tend to use um, the same acceleration factor during training that they intend to evaluate later during testing. And then they train separate models for each acceleration factor that they test for. And that's not our approach. So we assume that the model should handle every acceleration factor, more or less. Uh, so we, as I said before, we sample from this uniform distribution. And we uh, were wondering how much of an impact does this have on our uh, final reconstruction. So we try to train a network using only four times accelerated subsampling masks. And as you see, there's hardly any difference in the results. Um, maybe slightly less on the two times, but uh, uh, negligible. 
so it doesn't really matter too much what the acceleration factor is that you train on, surprisingly. Uh, for the unit, however, it does matter, so you uh, get a drop in performance if you only train on four times accelerated masks. And it does slightly better on the four times accelerated, yeah. Um, next, we wondered how much data is uh, required in order to train um, uh, a recurrent inference machine. And so we trained one on uh, using one, three, and 10 subjects with around 50 to 70 2D slices uh, per subject. And you see that the discrepancy between uh, using one subject and three subjects is, uh, yeah, th there's a discrepancy here, but uh, going from three to 10 is really marginal. You don't uh, need to worry too much about that. So uh, we suggest that three subjects using uh, 150 to 200 slices should be enough, which is uh, good news because raw data is hard to come by. Um, so uh, yeah, to conclude, um, recurrent inference, inference machines learn to generalize well across anatomies, at least going from brains to knees. Um, and uh, they learn to generalize uh, really well across resolution levels, acceleration levels, and acceleration patterns. Uh, and we think this has a lot to do with uh, the forward model being passed as an input to the network, uh, along with the previous state to validate the, the prior distribution and also the internal states. I mean, every, every, uh, every one of these inputs, they provide the, the algorithm with some knowledge about what the image statistics look like. And uh, these image statistics, the UNET really needs to compensate for uh, through its parameters. So it's really training uh, on the image statistics as well, whereas uh, the RIM is free to sort of uh, uh, be more invariant to that. Um, and talking about the number of parameters, so the unit has 1.3 million, and the RIM we can do, because of the uh, recurrent architecture, we can uh, make do with only uh, 94,000. Uh, and that may also explain a lot uh, about why it's uh, overfitting uh, on the unit. Um, uh, finally, it uh, preserves more detail than compressed sensing. Um, uh, however, I think uh, there's still an issue of time. So for all this data that I showed you, uh, we've been actually using synthetic data because uh, MR images are acquired, you have multiple receiver coils and each of those coils produce an image. Uh, and what we did is compress those coils into one and then subsample and reconstruct. Uh, but we would of course like the model to work on all coils. So we've been working with that on that recently. Uh, and uh, uh, in that case, we are able now to, um, to generate 10 times accelerated uh, uh, images and reconstruct them fairly well. So this is really pushing the boundary, but uh, so there is some uh, blurring, but uh, I think it's doing a fairly uh, good job. And you see the corrupted images are really bad. And here is where it really has an advantage over compressed sensing because um, uh, when we uh, use this multi-coil model, um, we are not really adding much in terms of inference time to the model. It's uh, performing at about the same speed. However, compressed sensing, at least the toolbox that I'm using, uh, it really uh, becomes a lot slower once you add on these uh, multiple coils. Uh, so this is where I think the main uh, advantage over compressed sensing will, will be. But uh, we have yet to finalize more results for that. But yeah, so again, uh, let me thank you for, for funding me, and thank you all for being here and watching. I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, thank you for the very nice presentation. So um, if there are any questions. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. Um, with any learning-based method for reconstruction, you always run the risk that, for example, if lesions are present, they are smoothed out in the reconstruction because they weren't in the training data. Yeah. Uh, are there experiments you've already done to see if uh, your method is affected by this? No, because it's really hard to come by raw data with lesions. You can find some data with uh, lesions on the DICOM images, but not uh, raw data. Uh, so we haven't been able to do that yet, but we plan to do so uh, soon. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much a lot of the motivation behind, uh, you know, verifying how robust it is against different types of data, that it's not just pr um, creating bogus. Uh, so if it can, you know, recreate a knee based on seeing only brain samples, it should be able to handle lesions, but uh, we will verify it better in the future. You had this nice result where some brain structures started appearing, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a nice comparison. Yeah. Um, Back here, actually. So uh, I have. Um, can you repeat how you tackle with phase? How I what? 
how do you tackle with phase? MR images have magnitude and phase, right? So how do you, what do you do about the phase of the image? Oh, well, this is raw data, so it's uh, complex valued. Uh, so the face is just there, yeah, it just appears. Uh, you mean the face in the... No, I mean the, uh, the, the undersampled image and the fully sampled image will have different phase information. So you would have to reconstruct the phase as well. Uh, um, the face is reconstructed, yeah. I didn't show the face images, but I mean, what you reconstruct is the uh, imaginary and the real component separately, so you can uh, make the face too, yeah. Yeah, yeah here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I just had a, a question about the time it takes to do the reconstruction, to do the forward pass of the network of the REMs once learned. So, for example, for the 7T data, how long did it took to reconstruct? Uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, it depends a lot on the, the hyperparameters, so how many feature maps you use in the network and how many uh, recurrent passes you use. And uh, we sort of decided to opt for quality over speed. Um, so you could make it go faster, and the quality will be fairly decent still. It's not a lot of a drop. But for these results that I show you, it's uh, about 250 milliseconds. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. OK, one more quick question before lunch. Just, just very, very quickly. Um, when you're acquiring MR with a sparse manner, you normally don't have random sampling of the locations. You have spiral sampling, you have radial sampling, you have many other types of sampling, but not random. And those types of sampling that you can actually do in an MR causes weird artifacts when you're reconstructing, while random sampling does not, but you cannot actually do it in the machine. So have you looked into, when you sparsify your case space, if you do it with structure in a way that you can actually acquire in an MR machine, does the system still reconstruct images without any artifacts? Uh, well, no, we haven't uh, tested uh, prospective uh, downsampling, so uh, we haven't yet. But I, uh, yeah, I am not a radiologist, I don't really know, but I think that you can generate, uh, can you not generate uh, any, okay, well, yeah, that's beyond my field, so, it, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so using the non-gridded spiral patterns and such, you would have to adapt the model to that a little bit, so we haven't done that yet. Okay. Just because case based structure does cause artifacts when you're doing the inverse where you transform, obviously. Yeah, I mean, your artifacts depend on the, but uh, we are doing the same as, you know, standard in compressed sensing, right, to have these, uh, well, they use often Poisson disk or Gaussian distributed uh, sampling patterns uh, because it generates incoherent noise. So, yeah, I'm not familiar with what you're saying, but I will uh, look into it. Yeah, yeah, this thank you. So <laughs> this sounds like a good discussion to continue over lunch. And uh, this yeah. conclu concludes <laughs> the session. Let's thank all the speakers again. Thank you.